Hi everybody, welcome to this conversation about walls, Barcelona, and digital transformation. Digital transformation is a really hot topic amongst enterprises the world over. Consultants, analysts, and everybody seems to be talking about it. As Forrester pointed out, digital leaders have to respond to the clear and present threat of digital, digital transformation to their firms. Accenture also points out a similar trend that moving forward companies need to pursue digital transformation to survive, let alone thrive. And McKinsey is saying if you don't do digital transformation right now, you simply won't have enough money to do it later on. So when we go all over the world talking to people about how Apogee can support their digital transformation, a lot of times while people talk about the way that they're doing it or how they're going to do it or how it's a big initiative for them, really when you scratch the surface, we find a lot of people feel like this. When we see people feeling like this, our message is don't worry. There's a great model for how this has been done before. And that model looks something like the city of Barcelona. Barcelona is a great, well-known, world-renowned world city. They've hosted the Olympics, World Expositions, the Mobile World Congress every single year. And they've got great commerce, culture, food, entertainment, nightlife, great soccer team, and fantastic architecture. But Barcelona wasn't always like this. In the 1580s, this is what Barcelona looked like. It was a medieval city, a late medieval city with a wall built around it to protect the treasure within that had been brought in from its dynamic trade with the rest of the Mediterranean and its relative importance uh, in the Iberian Peninsula. But by the 1700s, the wall around Barcelona that was built for security had been replaced by a wall of control. And that wall of control was built and designed not to protect Barcelona, but to make sure that the city, which had picked the wrong side in the War of Spanish Succession, wouldn't rise up against the Bourbon Empire again. So not only was that wall built, but two fortresses that you can see in this picture were built on other, either side of the city. And at one point, the, city, the, the fortress you see on your right was the largest one in Europe at its time. And it was designed to keep control of the city. And the guns were trained not out, but in on the city itself. But life inside the city was a challenge. Life inside the city was dominated by folks cramped in these tight quarters that today when you go visit, it seems quaint and nice. But at that time, with the population growing from 30,000 people to 200,000 people, things started to get kind of packed. You had cholera epidemics. You had trouble with sewage. You had difficulty getting around. And it really became a burden to the residents and business leaders in the city uh, to, to deal with. You had folks just kind of everyone living on top of each other and it became untenable. And to make matters even more complex, the city of Barcelona was very successful commercially and continued to be so. They had a great trade with, the, with uh, Cuba. They had a great um, textile trade that was homegrown, one of the largest ones in Europe. And they also had uh, trade in, in uh, liquor and wine with Latin America. And all of that brought an enormous amount of money to the city. And the folks who were making that money wanted to build themselves nicer, bigger homes. They wanted to expand their factories and their businesses. And they couldn't do that because the city walls were keeping them in. In addition, the workers who were coming into work in all these industries simply couldn't find room to live. And so it caused a lot of internal strife within the city of Barcelona and a lot of problems for the crown in Spain. This is a quote from what could be considered a blogger of that time. He obviously wasn't a blogger, but he had a pamphlet and, he, and a newspaper, and he put out the, uh, this quote, that the city of Barcelona is great for bureaucrats, but for those who live from their work and profession and are really doing work, they had to leave the city and go find a new Barcelona because they simply couldn't live within the walls anymore. And what started to happen is factories and businesses started locating themselves in the villages around Barcelona, villages like Sanz and Gracia. And this caused a lot of problems for the city of Barcelona because suddenly their tax revenue started getting hurt. And it caused a problem for the king in Spain because suddenly he couldn't control this area that he had built this wall around anymore. So bottom line, the city needed to grow. The citizens and the business leaders were demanding change. And the walls of Barcelona in the 1850s eventually came down. And then they had to decide what to do next. Because outside the walls of Barcelona, between Barcelona and the other small villages around it, there was a lot of open space. And how were they going to build there? 
If they were going to be more open, what was the plan they were going to use? And that's where our hero, Ildefon Cerda, a city planner and engineer, comes into play. Now, city planning was a relatively new field in the time of Cerda. There weren't a lot of well-planned cities. And so he was kind of a revolutionary. And not only did he have to have the right kind of engineering mindset, but he also had to really be thinking about how politically he was going to get his plan put into effect. And his plan centered around a few basic principles. First, sunlight, ventilation, and greenery. All citizens should have access to these three very basic things. And also, a city should be built that removes the friction and creates a seamless movement of people, information, goods, and energy. So Serda came up with a plan, and this is what his plan looked like. It preserved the old city, the legacy city, didn't tear it down, but it also made provision for a very easy traffic flow between different parts of the city, between the port and the mountain, east to west, north to south. And it also expanded the city in such a way that the old center, while still very important, wasn't the only important part of the city anymore. And so Serda came up with this vision and was able to sell it both to the city fathers and to the government of Spain. One of the geniuses of Serda is that when he came up with this plan, he did so with more detail than just that drawing we just saw, but he didn't come up with too much. In essence, he didn't try and say what every single building should look like, but he did say what the configuration of each block in the grid should look like in order to meet his goals of a great uh, sunlight, ventilation, and greenery, and great movement of people, energy, goods, and information. And so this is what he came up with, a series of block blocks with different configurations that when put together would both meet his goals and provide a guide for the architects and developers who were there to build out their city, to build out his city. And these designs were codified into the ordinances of city planning for the city of Barcelona. And when Cerda was alive and still in power, he was able to make sure that the city basically followed his goals. And as time progressed and Serda moved on and passed away and others came in to power in the city, obviously the design of the city changed and the way the grids were built out changed. But basically, following Serda's basic pattern, the city remained as it is built out today. And it's called the Champla. The Champla means the example of a modern city. And this is what it looks like in practice. You can see the grid patterns. You can see attention to open space in the courtyards. You can see the boulevards. And you can see here that the city has a great um, interface between the old part of the city, the medieval part of the city, and the modern part of the city. In addition to paying attention to sunlight, greenery, ventilation, and the flow of goods, services, information, and people, what Serda planned became a canvas for a whole creative outpouring of architectural design. And this creative outpouring is best represented by Anton Gaudí. And Gaudí built buildings like the Sagrada Familia, which takes up one entire block of the grid, the Pedrera, the Casa Batallo, the Casa San Vincennes, and others. But Gaudí was not the only uh, architect and developer, although he is the most famous. There is a whole ecosystem of builders, artisans, architects, and developers that all were part of this creative explosion occurring in Barcelona to build the city of uh, Cerda's vision. You had folks like uh, Puig and Caldefesh, uh, Domenech and Montaner, Sanguier, Jujol, and Villaseca, who of course built an Arc de Triomphe because what's an 18th century European city without an Arc de Triomphe? And at the end of the day, the sum total of all these folks working together on this plan that Cerda created is a really enjoyable modern city, a city where you can go see a world-class soccer game, have a great uh, meal, do some important business, and sit on a park bench and enjoy the day as it passes by. So you have a great user experience in the city of Barcelona. And this is what they could have ended up with. Had they not followed this plan, they would have had to build the city out along the lines of these roads and property boundaries that you see here in white. Now imagine what that city would have looked like. They could have built without a plan, one project at a time, but it would have been really a rat's nest and just a continuation of the problems that they were having in the, in the center of the city at the time that Cerda uh, really started putting his plan into effect. 
And of course today, Barcelona is the center of a very large metropolitan area. And you can see from that small kernel of the medieval city where it's gone today. The thing to keep in mind is neither Cerda nor anyone else involved in this process could have imagined what today looked like 150 years ago when they started this process. But because they had good sense to plan along some basic principles that made a city livable and enjoyable for its citizens, they're able to have a great world-class city today. So that's a really nice story, but what does it have to do with digital transformation? Well, there's some basic principles that you can take from the story of the development of Barcelona and apply it to your own enterprise. First, your enterprise is here. It's locked up, the value of it is locked up behind a wall of control. Your most creative people are leaving and going to places like the Silicon Valley to start startups where they can be free to create and design digital experiences that your customers crave because they're used to their phones, their computers, and digital experiences all around them. Now, you could be here. You could be in a world where your enterprise is seamlessly interfaces with a digital world around it. But in order to achieve that, you're going to need a leader. And that leader has to be focused on two key areas. First, creating a great user experience for your customers, your partners, your employees, and everyone else who's involved with your organization, and by extension, your brand via your digital channels and digital activities. Also, in order to achieve that great user experience, that leader needs to be focused on removing friction from all the processes and all the data that's flowing into and out of and around your organization, as well as all the friction that your customers, partners, and employees encounter when they're trying to do their work day to day with you. Also, this is a big vision. You're not going to accomplish this funny one small innovation project at a time. This is going to require a major investment and a major platform vision for your organization to reach a great digital experience for everyone involved. And that vision doesn't need to be about tearing out, throwing away everything that's old and sacred to your organization. It's about surrounding that core, that legacy core that has a lot of value and a lot of important data for you, and surrounding that with an interface that allows you to interact with the new world, just, in the case, just as Cerda did when he designed the city of Barcelona. Another important aspect to Cerda's plan was that he planned, but not too much. Basically, he set rules for what each part of the grid should be configured like in order to be able to reach his, his desired goals. But he never got down to the level of designing each individual uh, building or fixture on the street. He left that up to others. In addition, Cerda's vision allowed for iteration and compromise, two areas that your organization will have to accept as you move forward on this vision. You're not going to be able to plan the perfect digital transformation experience from A to Z and then start implementing. You're just going to need to get started and, and realize and accept that you're going to have to work together to make changes along the way. Another key component of this process is a focus on enabling the architects and developers who are going to build, use their creativity to build out their vision on your platform because ultimately that's where the value is going to come from. It's not so much the value of only the organization and only your enterprise, it's what developers, both internal, external, partner, hackathon, you know, hired uh, third-party agencies, their creativity that's going to make your enterprise really valuable and a rich experience for those engaged with it. And finally, never forget that the very most important thing to do in all of this process is to keep building. Analyzing, staying still, and being stagnant only means that the rest of the market is going to pass you by and your opportunity to build a great experience for your partners, customers, and employees is going to be lost if you don't keep building and, and generating and creating your vision. Thanks for listening to this story about walls, Barcelona, and digital transformation. Hopefully you can see from this story that Transformation doesn't have to be a scary thing. And there's a lot of great examples of it being done in the real world, not just the digital world. 